you have your Bibles this morning, I hope you brought them with you. If you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and we are going to, with God's help this morning, complete this series on anxious for nothing. Anxious for nothing. Some of you here this morning, no doubt, probably even this week, have struggled somewhat with some anxiety, maybe some worry, maybe something has happened in your life this week that has taken you by surprise or caught you off guard. Um, And so hopefully as we round the corner here, completing this series, that you will be able to have some tools in your toolbox to help you when you struggle with worry or anxiety. I'm going to continue reading from Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 25 this morning and we'll go here to the end of the chapter. Before I do, let me have a word of prayer. And as I pray, would you do something for me this morning? Would you um, just take a few moments as I pray this morning and examine your own heart here today and ask God to to reveal anything in your life that is unpleasing to him. In other words, is there any unconfessed sin in your life? And if you'll do that this morning as we prepare, if God shows you anything, confess that sin to God, and then we'll begin as we open the word today. So I'm just going to pray, and you guys take that time and, and let God just search your heart this morning as we begin. Father God, we come to you today, and we are so grateful, God, for the love of Christ. I thank you, Lord, that your desire in all of our hearts, God, is to take us from the kingdom of darkness, transferring us into the kingdom of the glorious Son, and in that, Lord, not just providing for us eternal life and salvation, but, God, your desire is that we would know you. And so, Father, part of the process that we all go through as we have come to know this incredible gift of love and salvation is the fact that that one time, God, we we didn't know anything about you. But now you have given us your spirit, Lord, and your desire is that we would come to know you in relationship. And so, God, this morning, as we all look at our own hearts and we say, oh, God, please show us if there be anything in our life that would be sin, God, against you, that we would confess that sin before you even now, asking, Lord, that you would that you would, you would wash us this morning and cleanse us this morning. And thank you, God, that you're faithful to do that. And thank you that your love endures forever in our life. And thank you, God, that you are the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, Lord, this morning, I thank you that, God, we're able to, to see and know, God, those areas in life, God, that, that you can cleanse and wash us. We're already, we're already in Christ, but... But Lord, you you know that we get our feet dirty as we walk through this life. And so Lord, this morning as we just examine our heart, would you just wash our feet and cleanse us today, we pray. Holy Spirit, have your way and your will in this service. Thank you, God, that you've provided for us a way that we could live life here on earth free from anxiety and from worry. And so Lord, today we'll trust that your spirit will teach us in all things we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So follow along with me here. Jesus, we know, is speaking to his disciples, and there are large crowds gathering, and Jesus, of course, is sharing with this, them this incredible message, this sermon, if you will, the Sermon on the Mount, as we many of us know it to be, but it's a great, great, incredible uh, message that he shared with his disciples, and as we're making our way through here, we're understanding that Jesus made it very clear that those that belong to him have no need to worry, have no need to be anxious. No doubt the people in the crowds that were gathering around Jesus had all kinds of things that they were concerned about, worried about, anxious about, just living day to day in life, trying to survive. The difficulties that we encounter living this journey called life can create worry and anxiety. But Jesus tells his disciples that they are not to worry They don't need to be anxious. And he starts out here, continues, excuse me, saying, Therefore, I tell you, which is coming from what we were at last week, do not be anxious or do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious or worrying, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his splendor was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore... Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day its own trouble. Well, I know the last few weeks, I hope that uh, you've been able to take some of these truths that we have learned here, that Jesus has taught his disciples here about worry and anxiety. No doubt many of us are still struggling and tempted to worry, And we know that the majority of the things we worry about actually never even happen to us. And Jesus here wants for his disciples to understand something of very great importance. He's already spoken of the treasure, the fact that our treasure is not to be here of this world, that our treasure in our, our, our treasure location is not here, but it's somewhere else. It's actually in heaven. And he gives us the reason of why this is so important, and he makes it very clear, and even the Apostle Paul, as we're going to see, has made it very clear that the, the, the life that we're living here, this earth that we're living on, and this, this age that we're living in, is passing away. That it's not something that is going to last. In fact, it is very temporary in all of its form and fashion in the way that we know it to be. And so Jesus is trying to show his disciples who were literally pulling their boats up on shore, flipping them over, and following now after Christ. Christ wants them to know that, listen, when you seek first my kingdom, you can be guaranteed that my Father is going to provide for all of your needs. And I know that there are some of you here today that have some things in your life that you need and you've been asking and seeking God for, or maybe he is the last resort and you have been trying to figure out how you're going to accomplish this in your life by yourself. The truth is Jesus never intended for us to do this by ourselves and that's why he's given us his Holy Spirit and that's why he's given us the Son and that's why we have his word so that we're able to do this in a manner, in a way that honors and glorifies the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The truth is, we cannot do this in and of ourself. The truth is, and some of you may not like this statement, um, we are really not enough. <laughs> uh, we may think we are uh, in a selfie obsessed world, but the truth is, we're not. And God made it that way for a reason, because we need him in our life. And coming to Christ, we continue to need him, but Christ is going to promise to continue to provide for us. So today, let's not look at the preeminence. We already did that, that God says, listen, I must be first in your life, that I am the one that should be the the, the one that has first place in your life, and that your treasure's not here on earth. If if God's not first in your life, then your treasures are going to be here. And if your treasures are here, listen, you're going to be uh, greatly disappointed at the end of your life. 
And in fact, as you see things happening in our world, if you don't know Christ and you think that this is all there is to life, no doubt that's why so many people are on all types of medications and, and doing all that they can do through drugs and sex and porn and all that stuff to deal with all the pressures and anxieties of life in a world that is quickly passing away and trying to make understanding of what in the world's going on here. Jesus says, Christians, that's not to identify who you are. In fact, if you're here this morning and you're in Christ, he has provided everything you need to live a life without worry and anxiety. Isn't that good to know? So, first of all, he says, I must be first. If I'm first, that's where your heart's going to be, that's where your love's going to be, and that's where your treasure's going to be. So the things upon this life are going to be secondary, not primary. They will be secondary. The next thing we want to look at is the provision. And he, he does tell his disciples this. He says not to be anxious now. Do not worry. It's a command of God. He says don't do this about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about your body. In other words, don't be worried about all the physical things of this life. Don't let them consume you and cause you to be robbed of your joy and your freedom and your peace and your happiness. Don't allow that to happen. There's a reason for that because Jesus asked this question and it's really a question statement. He says, is not life more than food? Is not life more than clothing? In other words, there's a whole lot more to our existence than what we see in the physical realm of living upon this earth. And in fact, your, your purpose in life is far greater than you thought it ever was to be. He gives some examples of nature. By the way, if you spend much time in nature, you'll appreciate these things. Why in the world would a bird have a song to sing? You ever listen to the songbirds? Have you ever taken time here in the last week to go out into the nature that God provided and just listen to nature? A bird has a reason to sing. A bird has a reason to praise. And when they're praising God, they're worshiping God, it's a reminder to me that although a bird is not anywhere near as valued as you and I are, the bird still praises God in the fact that all of its needs are met. That God provides for the bird. The bird doesn't have the ability to sow and then to, to wait this whole process out and figure these things out. No, a bird just goes and gets. That's what it does. And every single day, God, the creator, provides for his creation in order that their needs would be met for the day. God will do the same for you and me. That's what God will do. He promises that he will. <clears throat> the question is, where our treasure is, obviously, is going to impact the way that we think in the way that we, 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 we focus on life. Please take your Bibles with me, and we're going to move through a few other passages of Scripture here. Um, we want to look at this great purpose, and the fact that God promises that, that our purpose is, is, is very, very great. And in Colossians chapter 1.13, you know I love this passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul here is sharing about a change in kingdoms, the fact that we now have, as Paul says, been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, and now we've been transferred unto the kingdom of the glorious Son. And in Philippians three seventeen through 20, I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul also says here. We're going to look at some of uh, Paul's um, writings here today to help us grasp this. Talking about our purpose, he says in Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 20, I want you to get this now, speaking now of the kingdom that you and I are in. If you're still a part of the kingdom or the dominion of this world and you don't know Christ, obviously you're probably going to have a lot of anxiety. You're going to have it is. life than this. I, I literally thought, you know, when I how I finally arrived. And what you'll find in your life without Christ is there is never any arriving anywhere. It's simply just a fog and direction that you're living your life in. 
And so in Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 20, Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. Paul says, you can watch how I live. I'll show you how to live. Just follow my example, Paul says. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, Paul says, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory in, in, and they glory in their shame. Listen to this. What is the description of those Paul speaking of? With minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, listen, we have got citizenship. Yes, we do. How many of you love to be a citizen of the United States of America? We do, don't we? We also know that being a citizen of this country provides certain privileges and certain things that those that are not maybe do not have. I know this from traveling over in other countries. While I'm there, trust me, I never feel like I'm a citizen while I'm there. I don't speak their language. I can very, very rel- seldom read their signs. Um, I, I feel out of place. I don't really feel like I fit there. I'm never really fully content and relaxed there. And in fact, everywhere you go, in a sense, you're reminded that you don't belong as a citizen of this country. And in fact, when you fly in, they also make it known that you're only going to stay here for a little while. And in fact, you're going to leave before long. And for me, there's nothing greater than the feeling when I finally land in DFW. And I walk in through the customs. And the line that I go in is the line that says, United States citizen, enter here. And I am so glad to be back in the country that I am a citizen of. And why am I a citizen here? Because I was born in this country. See, Paul says, though, you need to get something. You can understand some of this in the physical realm. Although I'm a citizen of this great country that we love and that we live in, this country that we love and we live in is going to pass away, Paul says. And Paul says, listen, Christian, you have been born into a new country. You have become a citizen by birth into a new kingdom. And your citizenship is the citizenship of heaven, he says. And so for me, I understand what Paul's saying here. Paul says, listen, this whole entire world system that you and I live in is all passing away. It is not going to last. There is a coming end to what we know as the age that we live in. And every Christian out there needs to know and understand that this is all temporary. That our king, the one that we are waiting for, who is seated at the right hand of the father, who is interceding for you and for me, who is there to to be the one that is our great high priest, the one who has been set above all things, the one in whom we are in, who have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms. We are of this kingdom and we are citizens of heaven. That's what we are. That's why for every single believer, we have a longing one day to go home. That is a longing. We have that. And that is our desire. Why? Because that's where we're citizens of. No no matter how long you're out of this country, you have a longing and a desire that you will one day get to come back home to your place of residence. And that is what we are due. Paul makes it very clear that we're simply just passing through this place. And only those who have their citizenship in heaven are privy to the benefits of being a citizenship of that kingdom. And what Jesus is saying for us and what Paul is trying to tell us is this, Christian, you have now been brought into a new kingdom. You've been born and by birth 
in Christ through regeneration and the Spirit of God living in you, you no longer belong, listen to me, it's very important, you no longer belong to the kingdom of this world. You now, praise God, have been brought into a new birth and a regeneration and you now belong to a new kingdom with a new king, and his name is Jesus, and you have all kinds of things that have been provided for you because you belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. See, as long as we think our citizenship is here in this world, we're going to worry about everything that happens in this world. We're going to worry about us, me, myself, my, what are we going to do? But listen, that's not where you are a citizen of. You are now a citizen, praise God, of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Just flip over here just a little bit and you'll, you'll find it. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love Paul's letters. I love, especially I love Ephesians. If you want to be blessed, just read Ephesians. I love it. Starting in verse 16, and we'll look at a few other passages here this morning that will hopefully help you understand this. I do not cease, Paul says, to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers writing to the church, the Christian believers, the Gentile believers here in Ephesus. He says, I don't cease to remember you in my prayers. And this is what he prays, that the God of our our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, all believers here, the spirit of wisdom. We need the wisdom of God that we would understand how very futile and temporary the the workings of this age really are. And the fact that God has called us to something far greater and much higher than what we will ever see living in this current age. There's something that God is doing in this age, being a citizen of heaven. Listen to what Paul says here. We need wisdom to understand these things and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Christian, we need to have knowledge of who Christ is, and we need the knowledge of who we are in Christ. That will help us when we come to a point, when we look at things, whether the doctor says, hey, you got the the C word, that nobody wants to hear the C word. Or you've got this, or your, your, your boss says, listen, we gotta cut back and you're gonna have to go. Or your marriage is struggling, or we have a child that's somewhere out there where they're not serving God. Or whatever these things are. Maybe it's, 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 you're lonely. I, I don't know what all of it is that you worry about or you're concerned about, but Jesus says, listen, Christian, do not worry. Don't worry. And there's things we can do and they, the Bible's gonna show us that. But he, he, he now goes on and says this. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Listen, we need to have eyes to see the truth of what all this really is. And many people don't have the eyes to see the truth of what all this stuff is and how temporary this is and what we're to do with the treasures that we have and why our treasure must be in heaven. And and the truth of the matter is when you understand the temporary nature of where you are and what we are living in and how this is so quickly going to be passing away. And that's why for the several months in the future, starting next Sunday, I'm going to be doing a brand new series on the book of Revelation. And so I'm doing it on Wednesday nights too, but I don't want all of you to miss out on what's going on in our day and in our time that we're living in. I want you to have the knowledge of God so that you can look at the circumstances of this world and they're not going to get better, ma'am and sir. They're going to continue down the spiral that they're in. And so when you're wringing your fist in your hands and saying, boy, if we can just get so-and-so in the White House, he's going to fix this thing. No, dear Christian, sir and ma'am, he is not. Or if we could just get you-know-who out of Congress, there's nothing wrong with getting you-know-who out of Congress. I'm all for it. But let me say this. 
It's not going to fix the world. It isn't going to happen. And why is the disaster going on in the Middle East and it always has been and always will be? Why are all the eyeballs of the world looking at Israel? Why is Israel so hated among the nations? Let me tell you why. Because God said that would be the way it would be. The timepiece that we're looking at as we wear the watch of the end times of where we're living in is literally one hand points to Israel, the other hand points to the Gentiles. And when the fullness of Gentiles comes in, guess what? The focus goes back on the other hand, which will be the nation of Israel. That's why they've gathered back here since 1948. That's why they're a nation again. That's why they're their own country. God says, I will restore them in one day. And they became a nation in one day. Why are all these things happening in our day and time? Because God is on the throne of all history and all eternity. And he is working his sovereign plan. That's why. So, dear Christian, you need not be full of anxiety and worry. God is working His perfect plan. You won't want to miss the study through Revelation because then you'll have some knowledge to why things are as they are. Dear ma'am and sir, if you're putting all of your stock in the trinkets of this world, you're going to be sorely disappointed. There's only one treasure. His name is Jesus. He's the only treasure. The rest of this is simple plastic trinkets that sparkle, that shine. Satan is the chief imitator. That's what he is. You're going to understand why does this big push with this one world? What in the world's going on here? It looks like they're trying to set up a one world governing system. Oh, they are. The Bible says it's going to happen. Why are all these religions dropping their barriers and saying, hey, listen, we all are going to God. Let's just go our own way. So let's all come together. Why is that? Because the Bible says it's going to happen. So what is going to happen? Tick, 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 tick. The word of God is being fulfilled in our day. Daniel couldn't understand it. God told Daniel, seal up the book, Daniel. At the time of the end, these revelations will be made known. We're living in those days. That's why prophecy has become so important in the last hundred years. Why? Because all of a sudden, men can look at things and go, wow, (laughs) I understand what that means now. And you're going to learn some really incredible things about our God and about the days in which we're living in. If you're a citizen of heaven, this will bring great joy to your life. If you're not, when you hear about what's coming, literally hell on earth is coming. Dear sir and dear ma'am, if you do not know Jesus, whether you're watching today or you're listening by radio, you're driving in your car, you're at work and you don't know Jesus, listen to me. Christ is coming again. And what's coming upon this earth is going to be a literal hell on earth. It's coming, but there's a way in which we will escape this great persecution. It is by Jesus Christ and him alone. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Dear Christian, if you're here this morning, you can put your stress balls back on their rack. You, you, you can relax when it comes to what's going on in this world. Not that we don't do things. We do. But I don't stress about it. Stop wringing your hands about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on your body. Because your life means so much more than these things, as we shall see. So Paul continues on here having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know, we got to know something, the hope, the hope to which he has called you. Paul says, listen, if we only have hope in Christ for this age, we of all men are to be the most of all pitied. Is that not incredible? If your only hope is Christ for this day, 
in this age in which we live. And it's not for something for a, a greater purpose and for all eternity, then, then obviously we don't have the hope we should have. It's, our hope is in Christ and we have a reason for it to be that. We have a reason for that. He goes on and says this, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Oh, Christian, that you could know this hope. What are the riches? Oh, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's you and me in Christ, if you're a believer. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward those who believe? According to the working of his great might, that God also worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, all power, and all dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, listen to me, but in the age to come. And he put, God put what? All things under his, who's his? Jesus, under our king's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills, listen, all in all. Dear Christian, you are the body of Christ upon this earth. And that's why we pray his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because our head, Jesus, is in heaven. And we are here to accomplish, listen to this, is incredible. His purpose upon this earth. It's incredible. It's amazing. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at 18 through 19. Paul's going to reiterate this. For though, excuse me, for through him we believe, we, I mean, for, for through him we both have access, talking about the Jew and the Gentile, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer, it's what we once were, strangers and aliens. But have, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. See, the truth is, when I go to another country, I don't stop being a citizen of the United States of America. I don't ever forget my homeland. I may be there in that country and I may be doing the work of the Lord in that country, but I'm not a citizen of it. And this is what it is for you in Christ. Listen to me. You are a citizen of heaven and you are living here upon this earth and you are here to fulfill the purposes of your king your Lord and your God, which is in heaven upon the earth. That's our, our purpose. If our purpose is that, then we can understand why we use all the things of this temporary kingdom now to do what? To do the work of that kingdom. This is how incredible our God is. When you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You are subject to the king. He actually went to war for you. He actually died on the battlefield called Calvary. He bore the penalty that you actually had, had, had coming and earned. He paid the full price and ransomed you and me by his blood. You were bought with the very precious blood of Jesus. You are no longer your own. And, and the, the incredible thing is this. It's not that I went kicking and screaming from the kingdom of darkness. I went running to the king of glory. When I understood who Christ was, 
And He was my only hope, and this world offered me none. I didn't go kicking and screaming and begging not to leave this kingdom behind. I willingly chucked it all and ran to the foot of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the treasure. He, I didn't, he didn't have to ask me to sell everything. I had nothing anyway. All I had was my sin and my, and my, my lostness and my blindness and my darkness. That's all I had. He is the light. He is the king. He is life. He is, he is all things. And so it's not as if Christians, this is how some Christians are. They're holding on to the kingdom of this world. Oh, I don't want to leave this kingdom. Are you kidding me? It's because they do not know the treasure of the kingdom of God. That's why when you've got yourself tied off and you've got yourself roped down to the saddle horn of this world and you won't let go, you do not know the king of the kingdom. And you haven't seen the treasure, I promise you. See, the truth is, Undally your rope. And in fact, there's sometimes you have something tied onto you. You want rid of it now. It's pride that says, I got it. That'll get you hurt. That'll hurt somebody else. When you know the treasure of the kingdom of God, you're not clawing, hanging on to this world. Oh, I want that. I can't have that. No, you're not. You are goodbye, baby. And you run to Jesus with absolutely nothing. That's the truth. You don't do that. Christian, it ain't nothing but trinkets, man. It's all it is. The treasure is Jesus. And you know what? Social media tells you every day. You've got to watch some things. What we see has impact on this. What we hear has impact on this. The world we're living in, listen to me, is all about the kingdom that is passing away. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. It's all passing away. Don't have your mind on earthly things. Keep your mind on Him. The reason we worry is because we are being sucked back into this vortex of an unreality of reality. And everything you listen to says you want to know what life's all about. It's about fortune. It's about fame. It's about climbing the ladder. It's about you having the best house in the neighborhood. It's about you driving the newest, latest, greatest. Some people have to have it all brand new. And it's nothing but a trinket of a passing kingdom. That's it. That's why we're always doing this. Worrying. Oh, oh, no. That deal's passed away. This is what it's, listen to what, listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. I gotta close here. 2 Corinthians, go with me to 2 Corinthians, please. It's the other direction. (laughs) 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me read this to you. That's why I say today, unfortunately, the false gospel has made most people, not most, many people, saddlebag Christians. Jesus, he's a trinket and a pretty good one, but he's not the treasure. And in fact, when I stop my pony and I'm at a crossroad, I see I'm, it's, it's, uh, it's hobby time. Let's see here. Hold on. Dig through my little saddlebag. Whoop, there it is. Okay. 
It's Jesus, the trinket's still in there. Oh, whoa, 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 hold up now, hold up, hold up. I've got to do a good post today. I had a hellion post yesterday, so let's find my trinket of Jesus. Hold on, hold, hold, there he is. All right. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Throw it back in the saddlebag. Hellion all week. Whoa, Sunday, where's, well, hey. Pull that sucker back out. Thought I lost him. I got him. Trot on into church. <laughs> no. You know what the truth is? A true believer in Christ has no saddlebag. For I'm the horse who is being ridden by the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when he says, woe, I woe. When he says left, I go left. See, he's the one who sits on the throne of my life. He's not something I just carry with me. He is my all and all. That's what he is. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Paul's going to talk about this ministry that you and I have been given. Oh, it's an incredible thing. You thought being a CEO of some firm was the greatest thing in the world. Nah, sorry. It's a trinket. It can be used for the treasure. It's just a trinket. Listen to what he says. In verse 12. I'll read this, then I will close, I promise. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances, things, trinkets, and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, Paul says, it's for God. If we are in our right mind, although it's questionable at times, it is for you. For the love of Christ, listen to this, the love of Christ, our King, of the kingdom who bought you and me by his purchasing his by his blood the love of christ controls us because we have concluded this paul says that one has died for all therefore all have died and he died for all that those who live here it is for those of us who have been resurrected with christ who have died with Christ, rose with Christ, seated with Christ, for those of us who are in Christ, Paul says, listen to this, for those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, Paul says, we regard no one according to the flesh. A worldly way of looking at things, Paul says. We don't do that anymore. When I have that co-worker that grinds my gears at work, that doesn't know Jesus, I want to knock him smooth out. That's the world's way. I want to cut him to shreds. I want to do this or do that, whatever it is. I want to tell her her fingernail polish is ugly. All right? And if it's a guy, oh boy, who ain't going there? Listen, but listen. Even if it was, listen. I wouldn't regard them with eyes of this world. Even if it was pink, I would regard them with a different set of eyes, with a much higher purpose and understanding and knowledge that Jesus Christ died for all and that they are blind, lost, and still part of this dark kingdom. Your first fleshy reaction is not that reaction. That may be your first, but what must grab you really quick is that you begin to look at this world the way Jesus looked at you that he died for you while you were still a wretch. Just as he died for that person who's still lost in darkness. 
Don't regard anything in this world from a worldly perspective. Then he says this. This is powerful. Even though we once regarded Christ according to our flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, this is it. Listen to me, Christian. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Don't you thank God that that's true? You are not somehow above the rest of society. Oh, no. Of all things, you ought to put yourself down here and and look at society in the eyes of Christ as he looked at all those who were cheering for his crucifixion, and what did he cry out? Father, this is huge. Forgive them, for they don't even know what they are doing. How, if we addressed our world that way, Christian, they slander you, beat you down, talk about you, whatever it might be, if you looked at them and said, you know what, they don't even know what they're really doing. Because without the truth of the gospel, they're lost. And if you and I don't take on the responsibility of the body of Jesus upon the earth, how is the homosexual ever going to come to know who Christ is? How is your, your, your son or your daughter or your wife or your coworker or, or some lady that's caught in all kinds of stuff where she's in prostitution or drug addiction or alcoholism or whatever it is that Satan has bound them to, how will they know Jesus if they can't see him in the body? See, your purpose is so much greater than you getting more. It's about you becoming less and God becoming more in your life. There is no purpose in getting a... It's useless. But oh, that God would infiltrate your life. Paul says that we don't regard him according to the flesh. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Listen, don't get puffed up in yourself. All this is from God. Oh, man, when I see puffed up Christians, I want to slap the dog out of them. I'd like to pop their balloon real fast. Because you ain't nothing outside of what Christ has done in your life. Nothing worth in a we're worth worse than a puffed up believer who thought Christ, who though Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry. Here's your purpose, one of them. The ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, listen to it. There, here, here it is, here's one of your purposes. For all the things of this world that you use, here, here it is. That in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sin against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. I am a citizen of the King of Heaven and the kingdom of heaven. But he has brought me here, and he has saved me out of this kingdom. He has purchased me. He's marked his brand on me. And now I have been given the calling in every single believer to be an ambassador for the king himself who sets upon the throne here upon the earth. And what is the ambassadorship look like? That I would look at the world like my king. And I would tell them about the one who has already provided for their freedom from the enslavement and the darkness of this pathetic kingdom that we live in upon this earth. Jesus Christ came to set them free and give them life. Life. God is so good. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, Paul says, on behalf of Christ, 
be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See, dear Christian, we didn't really get in. There's more you can read for yourself. I apologize. We didn't get through it all. The truth is, when you know who the king is, and you're in his kingdom, he says, seek his kingdom first. Guess what? I'll take care of all this other stuff for you. Don't wring your hands. Don't stress out. Don't get your ideals from this world because they're all of this world. Get your ideals and your truth from the king who's coming and he's going to rule over this entire world. That's the treasure. Jesus Christ is his name. And he came to give his life a ransom for all who will put their faith and trust in him and believe. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord God, that you would somehow, and only you can do this, speak to your people, all people, according to your own purpose today. And Lord, as this old earth continues to move forward, there's going to be more and more anxiety opportunities. <laughs> and in fact, this thing's culminating to a point where the, the tribulation that's coming upon this earth will be so great that men are going to cry out, not to you, God, but they're going to cry out for the rocks to fall on them and kill them. It's coming. And so, Lord, while we're still here upon the earth and you haven't yet come back to receive your bride, the church, we have been given an incredible responsibility from you. Out of an overflow of our love for what you've done for us, we no longer live for ourselves. We now live for the king. And your purpose in us is also that we might be ambassadors to share with this world this message of reconciliation unto God through his son, Jesus. And Lord, if that's our focus, then we can understand why the things of this earth are really not going to rock us like they will others. We have hope, but not only in this age, but for the age to come. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here listening, watching, or here in this room, that does not have this hope. I pray that your Holy Spirit's drawing them now. They would hear from you the drawing of the Spirit of God. They would recognize their hopeless condition of their sin and lostness and no hope and darkness and all that goes along with being enslaved to the, to the God of this age. That they would look at what they have and what you have provided eternal life, forgiveness, adoption into the family, a king's kingdom, all those things. They would turn loose of the, the garbage of this age and cling to the treasure of God in Christ. Lord Jesus, we love you. Oh God, one day we will all be with you in glory. And, oh, God, we may not remember this day, but we will fully know you, God. We will fully be known, and we will rule and reign with you, as your word tells us, upon this earth, God, for a thousand years, you're going to set up your kingdom where you will rule and reign, and there will be, it, will be a, it will be no freedom to sin. It will be people living in the kingdom age. And God, we are going to rule and reign with you, God. So God, I know that my brothers and sisters in Christ here today, some of them are really struggling. Some of them have heard the C word. In fact, it's not been long. And oh God, that word cancer scares us all. But Lord, it need not. We know who you are, Jesus. And Lord, the truth is you will not take us from this earth one second before your will and purpose is accomplished in our life. And no cancer will take us, no person will take us, no tragedy will take us, no event will take us until you, God, say, yep, it's time for you to come home. We don't have to worry. 
you have the last word in absolutely everything, God. We love you today, Jesus. Go with us. Help us to remember that we no longer look at the people and the things of this world from a fleshly perspective. Help us look at people like you do, God, with a kingdom eyes and a kingdom purpose for the King of kings and for the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Hard to read, but the fans.